Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome again. My name is Herb Selesnik. Uh, among my three MIT degrees, it has a master's degree from the Sloan School of Management in 1964. It's a pleasure to be back here for our 50th reunion of that master's class. We have, you have a little better quarters than we did. I can see that right away. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speakers, Jason Jay and Michelina Jester. Um, their subject being action learning, Happy coincidence that my wife here and I, for the past 35 years, have operated an action learning consulting practice with our focus on uh, large federal agencies. So we're as eager as any of you to hear their remarks. Jason directs the MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative and teaches courses toward the MIT and co-teaches and manages the S-Lab course that connects world-class students with sustainability innovation projects in leading companies and non-governmental organizations. Jason's research focuses on hybrid organizations, social enterprises, and cross-sectoral collaborations that enact and promote more sustainable business practices. He focuses on developing people's leadership capabilities, particularly their ability to have authentic, effective conversations about sustainability and other values-laden issues. I can attest to the importance of authentic, effective conversations about difficult issues in any action learning practitioner's world. Michelena manages a team of faculty and support staff that designs and deliver action learning courses for graduate students at MIT Sloan. She also lectures at MIT Sloan on leadership, project management, and personal reflection. Could you move the microphone up, please? Sure. Personal reflection. Again, another, another very important uh, element of action learning in the practitioner world. Michelena mentors student teams tasked with real organizational and business challenges in growing mid-sized companies, and she evaluates the analysis and effectiveness of recommendations for corporate clients. Please join me in welcoming Jay and Michelena. Thank you. All right, perfect. Great. All right, good afternoon. I am very happy to be here with you. Uh, for those of you who have not been in this lovely new building, uh, this. Uh, uh, they opened this building uh, September 2010, which is when I started here at Sloan. So this is all I've ever known, but I know it's uh, pretty exciting for everyone else. So, um, so Jason and I are going to talk with you a bit about action learning. I'm going to talk a bit, uh, kind of go over um, kind of where we are with action learning. Uh, Jason is going to talk a bit about uh, S-Lab, Sustainability Lab and also bring in a live case for us to discuss. So we're going to have a little bit of uh, dialogue and conversation. And then I'll do a wrap up uh, to talk about some of the challenges that we have with action learning, as well as ways that you can help. So perfect. So I wanted to start off by showing this slide. And how many of you have seen this equation before? So the, um, the rate of learning must be greater than or equal to the rate of change. Uh, People have seen this before. So, um, you know, certainly, you've, if you hadn't seen it, you know, it certainly makes sense. So one of the things that you want to do um, as an educator, uh, whether it be you're looking to educate within the classroom, educate within your organizations, your companies, you want to make sure that the people that you have within your organization, you're developing them in a way that's keeping up with the dynamic changes of the environment. And I would make the argument that, um, you know, if you look back at business schools and how they were founded back in, you know, the very early uh, 1900s when they were, you know, just kind of just getting started, um, they didn't have a great reputation. And some of you may know this. They were kind of seen as trade schools, uh, lacking a lot of rigor. And in reaction to that, there was a Carnegie report that came out in the late 1950s, uh, Ford as well, late, tiny, late, late 1950s, early 60s, that really just bashed business schools. You know, they're, they're a trade school and there's nothing really going on there. And so you really had this very strong shift from practice to theory. Uh, and a lot of business schools started aligning themselves with science of arts, uh, arts and sciences. You had more faculty, more focus on theory and rigor. Over the years, business schools have been trying to balance this. You know, so how do we get at the rigor that we know is very important, that we do have uh, you know, developing good theories, good theories around management, but also have very relevant and very practical experience? And um, since the 1990s, you've definitely seen a shift among business schools to figure out, you know, we're, we're hearing 
feedback from the folks that hire our students. Uh, um, I'm sorry, we, we hear feedback from the folks that hire our graduates, and um, and they're saying they they don't they lack real world experience. Uh, uh, lots of theory, no real world experience, and so you've had this shift, as I said, over you know since the 1990s, where business schools have really started looking at project based learning or action learning, and so. When we look at action learning, it's, um, you know, I think that for the most part, uh, sometimes it's portrayed as, oh, the students are working on projects, or, oh, you know, they're just uh, taking a trip. Um, and I don't think that oftentimes it's not really given the, the weight that it, 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 it properly deserves. And um, I will say for myself, as someone who came into action learning, I was working as a consultant for a number of years, and then worked with a whole range of folks doing action learning work within their corp within their organizations and corporations. So I worked with folks that were uh, building uh, airplanes. I worked with a lovely group of very enthusiastic nuns who were looking to uh, do in incorporate some action learning into their work. So just a very wide variety. And I remember thinking to myself, "Wow, this, this seems really interesting. Um, I don't get why it's such a big deal, but okay, I'm going to go with it and I'll, I'm going to participate and I'll, I'll be in involved in this." Um, Interestingly enough, somewhat, uh, you know, a few years later, um, I started doing work for my doctoral program uh, when I was at Columbia, and sure enough, I ended up one of the courses that I take because you know my, my my background is in uh, adult learning and leadership, but one of my courseworks was action learning. So it was very interesting for me to think about, here's what I understand from my experience working in the corporate world, and now let's think about this this pedagogy. And like this quote says, it's one of those ideas that seems really simple, but there's actually quite a bit uh, pedagogically that, that's really under, uh, kind of underlying this. And I would say that, um, you know, and I can say this with great pride, I think that Sloan, MIT in general, does this better than most any other place. I think that it's because it's part of its DNA. It's not a leap for them to go from theory to practice, um, as for some other places, but, um, and then certainly at Sloan, one of the things I always say that's part of our secret sauce here at Sloan is that the faculty want to do this, and they're very enthusiastic about doing it, and you'll hear Jason talk a bit about his, uh, his work too, as well. So very roughly, action learning, work on an actual project or problem. It's an approach to working with and through peers. Peer learning is a very important part, a very important component of this with, our, with the students. Um, the students are working on a real world business challenge. And as you might have seen, for those of you that had the opportunity to take a look at the posters, these are not just made up problems. This is not internships. They're really tackling difficult managerial problems. And in the process, we give them a little bit of a gap so that they're, they're, they're having to, to press themselves and push themselves. Oftentimes, it can be in areas that they don't have a lot of background knowledge in. But they're meant to synthesize the work that they've done in their core courses, work that they've done in their, um, uh, in their previous work experience, and bring all that to bear on some managerial challenge that's being presented by a company. And in the process, what they're learning about is they're learning about leadership, they're learning about negotiation, they're learning about influence, and in a way, all of this helps to enact the principles of, of Sloan of you know, really developing innovative principled leaders. Um, we like to think, you know, I think that shorthand, we, uh, you often hear people say, oh, it's kind of like an, a consulting engagement. It is consulting light, but we're very clear that it's not a consulting engagement because consulting uh, suggests something that we're not doing. This is a vehicle for learning for students, and the weight of the work, the weight of the interest, and what comes out of it is with the students and with the student teams. Um, and uh, we, allow the mentors to step back a bit and really allow the students to, uh, to take uh, full ownership so that they get the most out of their learning in this work. So I want to talk briefly. I, I mentioned that uh, quite a number of business schools have really moved forward with, uh, with doing action, some form of experiential learning. Oftentimes, they call it action learning work. Um, these are very small, uh, and I apologize for that. But just to highlight some things. Um, each school that takes up this kind of work does it slightly differently. Um, the, so for example, the one thing that, uh, that, that's very unique about Sloan is the fact that the way that within the MBA, pro within the MBA program, uh, students finish their core within the first 
semester, and so they have essentially three semesters to participate in Action Learning Lab. Um, and they do. Uh, pretty much it's more than 80% uh, that will participate in at least one of those electives. For other schools, they run fairly, they run it differently. Um, HBS, uh, which I'm, you, I, there's, was lots of press about this, uh, but H HBS just started their fields program, which is similar to, their act, uh, to our action learning program, and they require all 950 some odd of their students to participate uh, in the lab, or in their, I'm not, excuse me for saying lab, uh, in their fields program. And um, they, their interest for their students and the way that, that their program is modeled is meant to address their particular challenge, which is um, the feedback that they were getting as they were going into the workplace um, and that their career development office was getting was that you have great individuals, but they don't know how to work on a team. And so for their work that they do on their project-based learning work is really about how do you be a good team member and how do you give and receive feedback. So there's a lot of emphasis on that for that program. For some of the other programs, uh, Kellogg, for example, some of it is about global immersion. Global immersion. How do we think about being in uh, in emerging markets, uh, a global experience? Um, and then, for example, for Wharton, very much focused on uh, on leadership development. Their program, um, they have one program that's exclusive. Students have to apply for it. They only pick for the the the, the top. Uh, the, the top teams to to participate in this, and so it's it's very narrow in terms of who participates. But the idea is that you're really pushing uh, the leadership. I would say that for Sloan, again, what makes uh, Sloan unique is the fact that we have lots of opportunities for students pr to participate in these. Uh, they are electives. Um, if they don't like any of the more than a dozen that are available, they can work to create their own, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So oftentimes we joke about the alphabet soup because you'll hear G lab, L lab, S lab, uh, something, some letter in lab. Um, there's actually another lab that's going to be starting this year. That'll be our 15th going into this fall and that I just found out about. They don't have, they haven't quite figured out what their name is and they want to figure out what letters are available uh, so they can figure out what they call, what they call themselves. So uh, we're going to work with them on that. But um, essentially, we have, um, again, more than a dozen, 14 at this point, soon to be 15, uh, different labs that students can participate in. Um, the enterprise management uh, lab, what we call M-Lab, is for those that are on the enterprise management track. Uh, the global, where is it? Oh, global organizations, that's uh, for the EMBA program. And so it's a little, uh, that's uh, also relatively new for us. So again, we have a lot, our, our alphabet soup of labs. And this was just to show you some of the, the, the numbers and the impact. So since 2000, now mind you, I would argue that Sloan has been doing action learning for a very long time. In its modern manifestation, that's been relatively uh, recent since you know, roughly 2000, but, um, but since 2000, there have been over 5,000 participants in the labs. And that's to say that you have increasingly numbers of students that will take more than one lab. So whereas before, people would take one, now they're taking two, three, sometimes they'll take five labs during their time at Sloan. Um, this number is going to change to 15. Number of projects completed have been over 1,000. And um, this year, faculty that are linked to the Action Learning Lab course is about 45. And again, as I said, one of the things that's been very powerful about what Sloan is able to do is that they attract faculty that are really interested in participating in this. Eric Brynjolfsson, um, who's done all this wonderful work around uh, uh, analytics, the students came to him and said, you know, you should really have a lab. We really think you should have a lab. And they kept asking him, we really think you should have a lab. And he'll have a lab this fall. So um, it's definitely a strong interest. And um, this number, the percentage of students participating in lab courses, it's a little bit more than 80. Um, and what we are starting to look more at is that we're seeing an increased number, again, of students that are taking more than one lab. So this is just to highlight some uh, fairly recent um, initiatives. So uh, uh, Jason will talk a bit more about the launch of the sustainability certificate, which has been, which is a very important initiative for, uh, for Sloan. Um, I mentioned the enterprise management track. 
that's meant to be uh, uh, for students that are just coming into Sloan to uh, really look at how they tackle challenges that are multidimensional. So they're looking at vertical horizontal integration strategy, um, let's see, strategy, uh, uh, organizational development, um, everything just within that, uh, uh, within the course of their, their work. And then as I mentioned, the launch of Analytics Lab that will start this fall. So um, I just, I put one student reflection up here just to kind of capture uh, in essence what uh, we typically hear for students that participate in lab courses. And this one says, the labs have been the capstone of my academic career. The opportunity to work on a real world, real time project in a foreign culture is the epitome of international management education. The experience has been life changing for me and I plan to define my own action learning life curriculum as I graduate from MIT Sloan. The phrase life changing, transformational, those are the kinds of words that we hear about students that participate in the labs. And what is fascinating for me is that the labs provide an opportunity for students to take a risk, take a uh, try out, test out, uh, work in something that may not be, have anything to do with their background, uh, may not have anything to do with um, uh, any work that they've done before. And they look at it as an intellectual challenge, uh, a way for them to broaden and add more to their Sloan, their Sloan tool toolkit. And, um, and they do fabulous work uh, all over the world when they do that. The, um, this quote just kind of captures one of our, our, our CEOs. Um, the students' work really allowed us to view things differently. They challenged us with various questions and gave us an out-of-the-box perspective. We were very impressed. One of the things that I find very fascinating with the CEOs that I had the opportunity to speak with is they, they're, they're, they're pretty convinced off just kind of out of the gate that we have four smart, very smart students from MIT Sloan. We know that they can do the work. What they're impressed is, is that the students really do want to work. Because I've actually had conversations because the students will say, they put us on the beach because they didn't think we really wanted to work. But we're re we really want to do something. We feel like we're, the first two days, they did kind of hang out. But <laughs> they're saying, you know, we really, we really want to work. Like we came here and we feel like you know, we, we want them to use our, our time well. And so for some of the CEOs, this is a bit of a switch because they are kind of expecting students to yeah, work a little bit, but mostly kind of come to hang out. And this is for the, the projects that have a travel component. But um, they talk about how impressed they are with the students, um, how hard they work on the, on the projects. Um, I, I met with a, a few CEOs um, in Latin America a few years ago. And uh, one guy said, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I've never worked with the team before. And he said, and I, I, he goes, I was amazed. And he goes, and I can't believe that, that you all are offering this for us, you know, for essentially. He goes, I would have spent over $200,000 to do the work that these students have done for me within this time period that they've been working. Um, these two, uh, two guys that I, I met, one was the CEO and the COO, um, they refer to themselves as uh, kind of computer geeks. Uh, they said, we never talk to our customers. We never talk to anybody. We're in our office. We're behind our computers. We deal with everybody by, by emails and faxes and things like that. And he talked about how amazed he was, how well that the students worked with their vendors and everyone else. And he said that a lot of times when they were you know, doing surveys and interviewing our people, we would just sit behind them and listen to them and watch and take notes because that's what we got. We got so much out of that experience. So, um, so I want to ask, um, Jason and Irina are going to come up and, and we're going to talk a little bit and just share a little bit about, uh, um, about her experience as, uh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> she's right here. Um, uh, talk about her experience uh, as part in the, um, uh, in LLAB as one of the first parts of L LLAB or are you doing? Yeah, LLAB. Okay, uh, talking about LLAB. <laughs> I know. <laughs> And you can talk about all of this. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to switch mics here. But um, has anyone participated, or, you know, as we're transitioning here, anyone have any questions or have anything to share about their alumni re reflections? Yes. I'm just curious, is this for both MBA and MBA students? It is open to all graduate students. Um, you know, I think that depending on the program. Oh, yeah, that might be. 
So the, the requirements for different programs are, are, are vary. Um, the MBA students, for example, don't need to don't have to write a thesis. Um, I would say that there are students who are doing joint programs that will often use their work within the labs as part of their thesis work. No. Sure. So, um, and, and just to say that we'll, we'll have about 20 minutes at the end to do Q&A, so as we're going through and you have any other questions, we'll uh, certainly be happy to entertain those. Um, the, 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 the way that we make the differentiation between, say, an experiential course and an action learning course, the action learning courses are, the, the students are working on an external management challenge of some sort. They're working in a team. Um, generally, those teams are anywhere from four to six students, sometimes students drop and it's like three, um, but generally it's about four to six students. And um, they are really, in a lot of ways, given, given ownership to move forward with that work. There is an element of reflection that's what we ask them to do throughout the process, and reflection in a way that we're asking them to really think very critically about their experience. What have they learned, and how do they think about that as they move on to their, their next milestone. And this is different than an internship where with an internship you're kind of sitting at the feet of. Um, with these, part of the reason why, unless it's, um, uh, unless it's pedagogically necessary, we tend to target small to medium sized businesses because we do want the students to work very closely with the decision makers. And in that respect, we know that the, the, the kinds of uh, uh, recommendations that they make uh, more a stronger possibility that, that they'll get implemented and an opportunity for them to learn from folks that are are, are, are leaders um, in their organizations. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to yes. Jason Mann. They're gonna uh, run us through a case and then at the end, as I said, we'll have some time for uh, Thanks for some Q&A. Thanks. Um, so uh, my name is Jason Jay. I'm a lecturer here at the Sloan School and I'm the director of our sustainability initiative. And I've actually been involved in teaching two of the lab courses here. One is called um, S Lab, which is Laboratory for Sustainable Business, um, which is really a, a, a strategy kind of focused class looking at sustainability issues. And the other one is called L Lab, or Leading Sustainable Systems, Leadership Lab. Um, and uh, in that class, we got started in the fall of 2008. Um, I've co-taught it with Peter Senge and Vonda Orlikowski. Um, and it really brings to bear Sloan's kind of expertise on organizational learning and leadership development to these challenges of sustainability. And when students work on these projects, they're working with a variety of different companies and NGOs. And as we'll hear about in Rena's experience, sometimes um, companies and NGOs together working on a partnership, a cross-sectoral partnership, which is something that actually aligns with my own research. Um, so I just want to say, before we get into the case, I just want to say a couple of words about sort of how these different pieces uh, fit together. Um, you know, and I think it really comes down to sort of the words on the wall right outside this room, which is that MIT Sloan develops principled, innovative leaders who improve the world. Um, and I can't tell you how significant it is that we have that on the wall, how much we talk about it, how much it's an integral part of what's happening at Sloan right now, um, and how much the action learning process is, is very deeply embedded in that because it gives people a context to actually work together to develop leadership skills, they get thrown into contexts that are challenging where they have to think on their feet and they have to be innovative. So it develops innovative leadership. And all of the labs, one of the things that unites them, I think, is this orientation towards improving the world. Now, sometimes that improving the world is improving the um, effectiveness of a medium-sized enterprise in a developing country where, you know, through a few ripple effects, you're supporting kind of, you know, economic growth and development of, um, you know, in, in the global economy. Um, in the courses that I'm involved with, with the sustainability-focused courses, there's another dimension to it, too, which is finding ways to align creating business value with solving the most important social and environmental challenges of our times. Um, and um, and, and the, these labs become a context for people to learn at multiple levels. So they should be learning about themselves as individuals and how they work in a context like this. They should be learning about working with others and what it means to be a team player and a team member. Um, they should be learning about business problems and how the organization is thinking about 
um, how these organizations are thinking about these challenges, um, coming up with ideas for advancing strategies and leadership, and um, an organizational change, and they should be learning about societal challenges. They should be immersing themselves in places that they never would have visited before, um, working on problems that may, that, that may or may not have ever been part of their experience. Um, and it's incredibly rewarding to be involved in this process, mentoring these teams, bringing companies to the table, all of which I do for, um, for these classes. So um, <clears throat> in, in 2008, when we started the LLAB course, the idea was to have students working on leadership and collaboration challenges in the context of sustainability. Um, and we brought a project to the table from BP, the energy company, um, that um, had to do with a partnership that they had begun to form with an Indian NGO, um, a network of women entrepreneurs in India. And Rina was a MBA student, a second year MBA student at the time. Um, and she's going to share who her other team members were, what that process and experience looked like. And she's going to queue up a very specific challenge that they faced. And I'm going to kind of put it back to you guys to talk amongst yourselves, work on how you would have tackled that challenge. So we'll have a little action learning experience here in the classroom together. And then we'll hear how, how it all ended up for Rena in the end. OK? So Great. go ahead. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rena Batia. Um, I was, I'm actually a huge believer in the whole lab system. I, I was the first year of China lab, first year of L lab, second year of S lab I took, and then I took like two or other ones and made up new courses for myself, I think. So I love the lab courses. Um, this specific one was actually a game changer in the way that I look at things. Um, I looked things beyond this project I did. So we had um, a very unique team. We had two Sloan Fellows, which both came from different backgrounds. And one was from Brazil and um, had started his own companies. Um, one was an executive out of Asia. And um, so Kathy and um, uh, Marco over there. And then um, Nathan in the back over there, he was part of the DUSP program, which was urban planning or urban studies and planning. And so between an MBA, you know, a second year MBA and then, you know, having all these div diverse backgrounds, one, going into the project, we were very concerned about how we would all mesh because we all have very different programs and different, and we didn't know each other going into this um, project besides going through the L lab process going up to it. And then, you know, we were put in pretty harsh environment. Um, this was in rural India. It um, probably, it's in Maharashtra, but it was, Maybe we had to take trains. It was about half a day's train rides away from Bombay. So um, as you can tell, it was very, um, this is, this, I think I actually took this picture. Um, it was pretty rural environment. So what we had to do is we had um, BP was sponsoring the project. And the NGO, and the name of the NGO is... SSP, that's right, was, um, was they had started this um, network of women around India to do like microfinancing loans. And so they were in the villages, they were the key contact to help microfinance loans and to be also uh, to help with some politics as well. And so BP used that network that they, SSP had created to sell stoves, bio stoves. And so, I mean, if you look at back, they would use um, dung, to fi for fire for cooking and the dung actually was really bad for their lungs it was bad for um it was bad for them to you know, the environment so in order to solve that problem they created bio stoves now two years down the line bp wanted us to come in and understand why were they losing money on these bio stoves why weren't why was the rural market not buying the bio stoves and so we worked with ssp and our on the ground contacts were SSP, um, and what we w and we had to interview the women. So they were our main contacts to the women. Um, they set up all the interviews. We had actually varying levels of rural rurality, I guess you could say. Is some people were um, very rural. They there they didn't they couldn't spend very much money, and so for them to buy a stove was three weeks or three months worth of salary or five months worth of salary to buy the stove and then they had to buy the pellets. So it's kind of like a razor and a razor blade model where you buy a razor and then you have to sell the, the um, blades. But then the women were making their business off of selling a stove and then selling the pellets. So 
if you look, if should I start digging into what we saw? Okay, so during the time we we were interviewing these women, and there were you know there were t and this is all through translation too. So we didn't speak any Mara Marathi, and so we had a translator there that would speak translate from Marathi to English, and then when they realized I spoke another in uh, Hindi, which is another Indian language, we would do almost a three level translation because they didn't want to translate to English, so they would do Marathi to Hindi, and then I would do Hindi to English to the rest of the team. So it was it was a very like long process to do all these interviews. Um, but we really did get to sit down. We asked the women, like, what was going on with these stoves? How do they feel about being there and selling these stoves? Many of them felt very empowered because they had a business. Right, so the the ability to have the business, they were usually the the market maker in their village, but two years later, they also felt very um, upset because the stoves have had increased in feature functionality, but almost doubled in price over two years, and the pellets had almost doubled in price over two years. So you can imagine that these women were, who were the market makers in their village, were now looked at almost thieves because they were selling these stoves to their friends and the pellets that they spent time and like they spent three months worth of salary to buy and then all of a sudden the pellets they couldn't buy the pellets anymore so now it's junk and so you could see that we had to like dig into their feelings about these stoves about why weren't the pellets being but then you also think about it the supply chain to get these pellets to the um rural markets are very different than sending it to a city. So it's very expensive for SSP to be running the supply chain as well. So we had to dig into supply chain issues. We went to the different distributors. We um, also talked to the person making the next product that SSP was going to have the women sell, which was Goldridge. And uh, Goldridge is a big appliance manufacturer um, in India. And their head is actually an MIT alumni. So he was he sp so sponsored us as well. And so we actually got to talk to um, the head of that company and um, understand from their perspective why they wanted to enter the rural market. Do you want to say a little bit about the experience of interviewing these women and how, how that went? I mean, did they? Yeah, um, it was it was amazing to interview these women, um, to actually sit in their houses. I mean, we were sitting like in their living rooms, on the floor, in their bedrooms. We would be in some of them actually had their own businesses and had storefronts, so we would actually go to their storefronts. Um, it was amazing, but it was also, um, it was hard to know what question to ask next because there's three levels of translation back and forth. Um, so one of the things we realized was that the SSP didn't really want to translate everything properly to us because they didn't want to look bad because BP was sponsoring us. So we were coming from a sponsorship standpoint um, from BP and you could kind of tell on their faces that the women were saying something different. It was like, have you guys ever seen that movie Lost in Translation? Yeah. yeah. So when, they, when, when the guy says something and then he goes, more intensity. And you're like, he said something more. He said something more than just more intensity. And that's, that's sort of the translation we had was they would say something really long, and then the translator would just say something really short, and we're like, there's something more in there. And what, I mean, the reason why I was able to catch it is because Marathi and Hindi are, Hindi are not that far apart. But you could also tell from the facial expressions. So we had to read them as much as we had to listen to them through this process. Great, great. So. Um I want to. So what I want to do here is is put yourselves into the t into Rina's shoes, right? Into this team's shoes, and in a very particular way, which is that you know BP has sponsored this project. They're paying for the travel for these four students to go fly over to India. They've been investing in this relationship with an NGO um, to do the distribution of these cook stoves in order to solve an important social problem. Right? Indoor air pollution is a major, um, you know, uh, health hazard in in, in these contexts. Um, so this is part of their sort of corporate responsibility or sustainability innovation type strategy. Um, and now the team is hearing some, you know, puzzling, possibly sort of alarming things, right? Which is that these women are being priced out of the market. Um, there's there, there's some tensions in the community around people who have bought stoves and now can't afford pellets. Um, 
And in fact, there were places where the stoves were successful commercially. Oh yeah, so should I talk about the yeah, marketing? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that we realized also as we started digging into it is they changed their marketing st strategy. So they changed pricing strategy, they also changed marketing strategy. Originally they were in the rural sort of farmer markets or community markets, and they would do like uh, murals on some walls and things, and then they moved to television. And they thought, well, it would be great because it's aspirational. Things that are on TV are more aspirational than things that are being marketed. Well, they found out, like, as they keep increasing the features and as they keep increasing or changing the way that they're marketing, it's a perfect mid-market. So that picture right there is actually at a mid-market seller, and it was fantastic for um, warming up your bath water for the mid-market because it was an affordable way to warm up your bath water. So now it's sort of a way that the middle class could buy something that you could move a, a stove pellet that you could move closer to the bathtub and warm up your water and stick it into the bath water. And that was um, something where they were doing really well. Like they were selling like gangbusters in this supply chain. Right. But you can imagine that for BP, this is a very different outcome from what they had intended, right? They were trying to sell a rural, a cook stove to solve this rural issue. But the way that this market had drifted was it's now become a mid-market project. So now you're a team of four students. You're on the ground in India and you've, conf you've confronted an uncomfortable truth, right? Which is, that, which is that the pricing strategy isn't working for the original rural market. It's, and it's sort of, there's a mission drift that's going on. Um, okay. My uncomfortable truth was they tested it on the rural market to get up to the mid market. <laughs> right, they tested the rural, so, so, and you could imagine a story getting out saying, BP tested this thing in the rural market in order to get to the mid market. And right, greenwashing alarms go off, right? So, so, so how do you, as this team deal with this problem, which is that you know something because you've heard it through, the trans, through this kind of oblique translation, and you've got to present an uncomfortable truth to the people who have sponsored your being there for a project. So what I want you to do is just turn to the, to the person or you know, one or two people next to you and just put yourselves in this situation. How would you approach this? How would you do this in a way that's diplomatic, in a way where everyone wins, including sort of the truth, right? So um, just take a few minutes here and talk through, you know, how would you approach this if you were in this situation? Go ahead. Yeah. Was this any margin? Uh, they had a small margin, yes. Yeah, yeah. They did yeah. for the, that's a good question. Yeah. Features they engineered themselves out of what their intent was, right? You can't blame them, but it, it's, yeah, it's kind of fixes that fail from a system dynamics point of view. 
That's it. Great. Thank you. Is, is there anything they could do on the pellet side? Or is that supply chain? Right. Pellets that they can cut out some metal man. Yeah, can you up? Leverage scale with other villages around there. Yeah. Could you create a co-op? Yeah. Yeah, that, that takes the place then. Because that's the long... The, the pellets are where the big money comes. You're really buying the ones, but if you're unable to get the money or whatever, you're down These conversations, I want to just, I want to just harvest a couple of thoughts, reflections from these groups, and then, and then, uh, and then, and then hear a little bit more about what what actually what actually went on. So, any anyone want to share just a, a thought, reflection out of your out of your small group? Go ahead. Well, uh, we agreed almost immediately that there's a lot of. Hold on, guys. Let's 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 come back together. We agreed almost immediately, unanimously, that there's a lot of value in telling the truth. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> without regard, not sugarcoating, not distorting, and not uh, downplaying the nature of the issues that were described so nicely by both of you, uh, we thought it might be valuable to have something constructive and positive instead of just a doom and gloom feedback. And uh, the credible way of being constructive, we thought, would be before we give that report, if there was some way to get back with each of those frontline salespeople and ask them what they would like to see their NGO, the product, or BP do differently or be different, what would be some ex ideas they had? Mm. And at least put that into our report as a report back from the front line of what the issues are and some possible things that BP and the NGO should consider for mitigating them. Great, great, great thoughts. Others, let's grab a couple of other just ideas from the from the group. Anyone else have any reflections on this? Anyone face similar situations? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Raina. So we came up with three um, three ideas. One was, could we lower the features of the stove to reduce costs? Because the original intent was a very basic stove that had feature creep to mm -hmm. increase it. Could could that uh, could a version be created that just offered the bare basics to get the cost back down? The second is, could you use the mid-market profits to fund or subsidize the lower mm -hmm. end market? And the third was, could we use supply chain improvements and enhancements um, to gain scale with regional partners? Mm -hmm. So redesign the supply chain to achieve to, to gain efficiencies and get the cost down. Exactly. Great. Right. Okay. Fantastic. Yep. So so notice something here, right? So. Part of what you're having to wrestle with is the business problem, right? What are some suggestions for actually doing some, you know, um, market segmentation, some cross subsidization, these sort of strategy questions as well. But at the same time, you've got to be thinking about how do we break that? How do we frame the message? How do we communicate? 
Um, okay, good. There was another one over here. Yeah, go ahead. I'll get. I agree with everything, or we agreed with everything that's been said so far. What I wanted to add was that when. Uh, one of the things that we need to talk about in that discussion with BP is your original intention was to abate indoor air pollution. We don't know that moving to the mid-market isn't doing that. So mm -hmm. let's go and look and see what type of abatement we're getting and compare that to their initial goal. Because it could very well be that they're actually abating more indoor air pollution serving this mid-market than they would have in the rural market. So it's something to think about. Ask them to go back to their initial goals and then yes. evaluate the progress. Um, so to date versus those goals and ask them if that's where they want to go. Super, super. Others? Any other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Well, we also came up, well, a lot of similarities of what been, what's been already said, but having like two different label products. But um, why can't they make it in the local market? Why can't we change some of the dung? They were using dung. But why don't they come up with something that's less... Uh, air pollution, indoor air pollution in the local market, lo have local vendors, local manufacturing, that would be probably solve a lot of the channels and uh, maybe the pricing problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Other thoughts? Let's take one more. From this table, it looks like you guys have some active uh, ideas. I'm going to put you on the spot. Cold call. Cold call. Okay. Well, I would just, if I had been on the team, I would be interested in the reporting structure of the like what was is this reporting into the famous BP advertising wing or is it it was this a real or business you know was it was it one of their you know we're dealing with a company that has many questionably Black spots. <laughs> <I> cannot, <laughs> exactly you know some of them the the so I would, I would really, I would really interested to hear, you know, as a, as a consultant, I'm, I, what one tries to do is to present a workable answer perhaps to a different question because they, they may not have been asking the right question in the beginning. So you have to change it up and ask the right questions mm -hmm. in the middle of your field work and then come up with an answer that's going to work. Yep. So great. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right, so Raina, let's let's turn it back to you and just maybe reflect on what you've heard and, and then share what uh, how things went down. Okay, so I'll start with the question at hand about BP. So BP was sort of one of those um, gave us money for it, but was not involved. But so, um, and they we, they were divesting <laughs> off of this actually as well. So this is sort of um, a bit of washing their hands of this thing. But what we did get access to was Goldridge, who was doing the next product in. And so this, um, this report was important for Goldridge, although they didn't, I don't think, listen to our answers to the problems. Um, but they, that did give us what, that, what the lessons were learned were to translate to what the next product they were selling through. So our recommendations off the whole thing was, one, yes, to keep a price point and then do features off of a price point rather than increasing features and increasing price point. And it was like one of our major recommendations off the whole thing. Um, the second was not to do a refrigerator as your second project, but to do a cheaper item. Uh, there was a whole thing around eyeglasses and women selling eyeglasses as well, and they had a whole kit. And we, we recommended that they go with something that's a lower price point to get the reputation of the women back up in the villages and to get them to be um, trusting this whole network of selling things through this rather than selling something that was, uh, the refrigerators was even more expensive than the stoves were. Um, that one wasn't listened to because they were already set up with this par partnership. Um, so those are our two main recommendations off of it. But we did tell BP in the report exactly what we learned because they were so divested at any point we were already ready to like just I mean this was our learning so we wanted to make sure that everything we learned was in the report and if they had actually read the report which I'm not sure they did we didn't get very much reaction from BP, BP. Um, yeah they paid for the project but they didn't really so so I'll so I'll I'll, I'll um, kind of then provide the host the 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 faculty kind of mentor perspective, right? Yeah. Which was the where we, you know, because we have the conversations, relationships with the hosts before and after these projects, and um, you know, so 
you know, they did the right thing in terms of conveying what was going on in the report. Um, what was going on in the BP side at the time was that, you know, BP had developed a whole alternative, alternative energy business, right? They were getting involved in solar and a bunch of other stuff. Um, they had set it up as a side kind of um, parallel kind of business structure that run, run by Vivian Cox, who was our, our contact there. And, um, and they were experimenting with a lot of different market segments in their alternative energy business. And this was their effort to say, can we do a bottom of the pyramid play? Can we do something where we're going to work through these networks of, of women, work in these very rural areas, these very marginal areas? And what it turned out was that the pace of the return on investment for bottom of the pyramid projects is incredibly slow relative to the normal hurdle rate that BP had. So even within the alternative energies business where they had set a longer term, a longer time horizon and a, long, a bigger, uh, you know, a, a lower hurdle rate, it still sort of wasn't making the cut. And so they were just, you know, they were trying to deal with this mismatch of business models and that was what informed their decision to divest from the business. And that what they did is they spun it off as a separate company to do these cook stoves. And on our side, we were sort of scrambling to get the funding for the project from BP in the middle of them divesting from this business, right? So as faculty, you can imagine the complexity of trying to set something like this up and make sure that four of our students are going to be well taken care of and in safe housing and everything else in rural India when the company is divesting from the company, from the subsidiary where the project is supposed to be happening. Um, so that was sort of the delightful aspect of this from a faculty side. And it's a little bit of what we do every year, semester in and semester out, as we get these projects going. Um, but we all learned a ton from this whole experience, which is why we wanted to bring it to the fore. Um, I want to just, um, and I thought the suggestions here were fantastic. As you heard, some of them showed up in the recommendations that the team got to make. Um, and they, they really drew out the mix of, again, sort of the strategy and content and business problems, but then also sort of the, the communication, collaboration, and the leadership dimensions of these projects. And that's exactly what we try to achieve with these action learning things. Um, I want to just close this little segment with one more question, which is, Reina, what are you doing now, and how has this whole process and project and experience informed your work? Okay, so um, I work at Salesforce.com, and I work with customers to do innovation workshops and solve problems for them around reaching their customers and seeing how they, they work through their customers' eyes. And so that involves a lot of deep discovery work, which all of this was incredible learning, as well as a lot of the techniques. So the thing is, um, I don't know if, you've re if you guys have read Peter Senge's work, but he's got a lot of techniques in the work. And you look at it and you're like, there's things like lad ladders of inference and check-ins that you look at and you go, ah, it's a little bit cheesy. I don't know if I really want to do that. But part of this action learning lab was to take, the, take a leap of faith into working with those techniques. And man, they, they paid off in spades. Like we were a very diverse team. We checked in every morning. We made sure that we um, understood how each other was feeling. Um, you know, the small crook in the side of the thing is I was one month pregnant at the time too. So I was like crazy, you know, just lots going on, you know, with everybody. And everybody needed to know what was going on if we were in such harsh environment. And with my teams, I, I mean, I ran a global team for a while and I, I checked in with them every team meeting. They, they kind of looked at me like I was funny and I said, every meeting we're going to have a check-in. And we checked in and how are you guys doing and how are you feeling? And so it actually made for a really um, well-oiled machine for a little while. And so the, the, um, I think the discovery techniques, the facilitation techniques that I kind of work use on my day-to-day -day job has been huge. It, it's all influenced from, this, um, from these projects I did at Sloan. And so that's why I remember the project so vividly after five years. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Raina. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Here, I'll turn this. So, um, I'm trying to do this multi time. So um, this will come back up in a minute. So, you know, so thank you so much for, for Rena for sharing her story with, with short story with us. And I would say that, um, you know, one of the things that <clears throat> one of the things that we, um, you know, to kind of alluding to or, or getting back to the, one of the points that Jason made in terms of what's involved uh, um, in, in taking these um, taking the, these uh, the, these projects up. So a lot of work from the faculty side, and you know, it, it is not no joke that it, it is resource intensive, and I mean not just from the faculty's time and attention, but all the other supports that um, that go into um, 
into doing this. And the reason, you know, as Jason said a little while ago, and I said, you know, to start, is that looking to develop principled, innovative leaders. And these are folks that are out, you know, really making a huge impact in the world. And, you know, I tell students that the action learning work is the part B of the case. So usually you get a case, it's very well organized, you have the nice exhibits at the end. The action learning, this is the case where there is no part B. This is the messy part, this is the real part. Um, some of the best learnings come out of students, you know, and I'm sure for, for Rena, just like her experience where you show up on site expecting one thing, it's something completely different. Um, students show up and they have their very nice, lovely computer with all kinds of stuff and models and things, and they get there and it's like, oh, rolling blackouts, right. So now what do we do? Um, one of my favorite stories, I had a student team, I was traveling, I got an email that said, mildly urgent cola robbery. When they ran landed on site, within two hours of getting on site, everything they had was stolen. So compute their laptops, their phones, everything. Because somebody had forgotten a toothbrush or something and they stopped by this little store. When they got back to the car that had been driving them, someone had popped the trunk, took everything out. And they wrote me this long email about everything it's stolen and what they were trying to do. And immediately, and they said, and we're, we're at the police station right now filing a report. And this happened on a Saturday. Immediately, I got another email that said, oh, by the way, just wanted to let you know that despite having all of our stuff stolen, and it really sucked that, you know, we, aren't, we, we lost our photographs and things like that, but we absolutely want you to know that we're 100% committed for this being a good experience, and we will not let this impact our time on site at all. They showed up on Monday as if nothing happened. The CEO contacted me and said, the students were amazing. He said they were absolutely amazing. He said, I was horrified. I felt horrible that they had had this experience, but they showed up and they moved forward. They were contacting people here, to catch people that were on their way to Jakarta, to bring them computers and stuff. Some folks from my office, we were running out to the airport trying to get them things, but they absolutely pulled it together. And I think that's a testament for the students at Sloan, their commitment to doing these, these, uh, these project-based project learning opportunities, as well as for the faculty, their commitment in really making these uh, an excellent experience for them. So um, as I said, you know, lots of, lots is involved in, um, in, in doing these, uh, uh, um, th these courses, um, resource intensive, lots of work around managing relationships, uh, making sure that we have the right fit. And so what I wanna do is just take a few minutes to maybe suggest some ways that you all might be involved as, could get involved with uh, the Action Learning Office as alums. So um, in terms of hosting, um, you know, certainly we have uh, some alums who help find projects within their companies or they host a lab team themselves. And, um, and we always love that. Uh, students love it because it's an opportunity for them to, collect, to connect with the, uh, with the alums and really um, and learn from their experience, you know, both in terms of uh, their, when they were here at Sloan as well as uh, life uh, post Sloan. Um, we've also had some alums who have hosted events. So when students, particularly ones that are traveling, when they're on site, um, just a way of gathering them together and, and really kind of checking in. Um, as I said, we really look for the students to own these relationships. So sometimes they're kind of off the beaten path in places and um, it's really nice for them to have a friendly face to check in with. Um, another opportunity is in terms of project vetting. We, um, one of the things, and as I talked about, was this idea of managing, uh, managing relationships. Sometimes having someone that maybe is local, that's on the ground, that can say, yeah, I'd be happy to go in, kind of take a look at the company for you, or um, you know, maybe check in a bit. We recruit over 150 projects every year for the more than 14 different labs, 15. I imagine that number is probably a lot, is a, is a bit more than that, but it's at a minimum, it's 150 projects. So my office is made up of three people. <laughs> um, uh, you know, Jason. Uh, Jason does recruiting for um, for for S Lab, uh, some for L Lab. Um, all the faculty. So lots of moving parts and lots of people involved. But in whatever way that we have folks that are on the ground that could check in, um, is is always very helpful. Um, again, check in, call or visit. 
and then even making some recommendations of kinds of projects that we should be looking into. So, hey, I'm in X industry and you really should maybe be thinking about projects in this area and make those recommendations to us because oftentimes what you're hearing and seeing out in the field, you guys are hearing it before, we're hearing it inside our institution. So those kinds of insights are always welcome. And then finally, um, serving in an advisory capacity, we love having mentor. We love having mentors, advisors that work with our student teams. Um, these are folks that maybe have industry expertise, maybe have content area of expertise, and can check in with the team. Uh, sometimes we have, uh, while we have lots of folks here who have uh, deep practitioner experience in various industries, we certainly can't catch the breath of the various kinds of projects that we have and. For the students to be able to find someone that has, you know, say, an expertise in solar energy in Africa or in Asia or something, but just you know, some very specific things that they may be looking for, it's always great to be able to have uh, someone that they can check in with, um, just to again give some insights. Um, we, you know, Jason and I have talked about this a bit, and I've talked with some other folks about this, but this idea of having kind of a Sloan ambassador, so having alumni that might be interested in. Um, you know, representing within their area, uh, maybe within their network, um, the action learning office, um, and you know, really helping us uh, in in our recruiting efforts. And um, one of the things that we're going to be looking to do going forward is developing an advisory board. So certainly, anyone that has an interest in this work, um, you know, Herb, Herb's done uh, quite a bit of this work already, but. Um, you know, any, you know, whether or not you have uh, experience in action learning, but just an interest in this kind of, uh, of, of work um, and supporting the, uh, the students here, I think would be extraordinarily helpful. So we would love to have you join us in that accord. And that is the end of our formal presentation. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. And now we just want to open it up for, um, for any questions about anything. Ooh, lots of questions. Great. <laughs> Please. I think, if I recall, the um, other side of MIT has an IAP program, mm -hmm. independent activity, right. which maybe doesn't have as much as a team component, although a lot of it more teams. Is there some, any overlap there? There's so, a huge infrastructure. So IAP here yeah. um, is, during January, the, stu the, the students that participate on labs that have a travel component will travel during IAP. Um, IAP. Okay. Um, and so students are typically gone for three weeks, uh, sometimes a little bit more, but they're, they travel during that time period. It's an opportunity for them to go on site and work directly with a host company. And for the labs that have a travel component in the spring, they will travel for SIP, Sloan Innovation Period, and for spring break. So they'll, they'll take a two week uh, on site uh, for their companies. What's the difference? I mean, I mean both of them, you go out, a lot of them go out external. Go on, on site. Um, two no, two parallel, but you know, but again, um, very similar. And as I said earlier, you know, I think that part of why MIT, why Sloan gets this in a way that lots of other business schools don't, is because it's been do we've been doing it for a really long time. So when you have, uh, you know, at the, you know, institute, you know, in the the, you know, all the different programs at MIT have some variation of doing some type of project-based learning work. It's not a huge leap for us to think about, okay, how do we think about having a course that has a project attached to it where there may be some travel involved. Um, and for some of these schools, this is very new for, the, for them. The other thing I would say is just that a lot of IAP courses that are, that are run through the institute are just, they just happen in the month of January, right? Mm -hmm. So there's not a chance to prepare people with conceptual material pre-January. The action learning, the fall term action learning classes at Sloan, you know, it's a it's a half semester or a full, full semester, semester set of learning. So before Rena and her Rena and her team went to, to India, they were in this classroom um, doing or actually I guess we weren't in this classroom. We were even in, the <laughs> <laughs> so in this classroom, um, you know, practicing check-ins, practicing using, you know, interviewing techniques, practicing um, you know, thinking um, systems thinking and systems mapping uh, and stakeholder mapping tools and, and practices so that when they go hit the ground in January, they can make use of those concepts, tools, perspectives. So that prepare or think, act, reflect, which is sort of what you'll see in this brochure about action learning, 
you need that time to prepare and to learn the conceptual material, and that's what the fall semester plus IAP does. It doesn't, it isn't really afforded by like a January only experience. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, I think you should tap more the alumni club globally. Yes. That's a very good resource. Uh, my wife, class 75, is, was president of the uh, MIT Club of Malaysia. So can I volunteer her? <laughs> is that OK with you? <laughs> and then uh, we have two kids, one here in Sloan and one in Harvard. This is just a light comment. They are on uh, G Lab, and they were just mm -hmm. comparing. Mm -hmm. My MIT girl was saying that she's staying in a three-star hotel. Yes. And my Harvard girl was saying she's staying in a five-star hotel. Yes, 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 absolutely. <laughs> So, so this and then uh, the yes, other thing yes, is absolutely. that my <laughs> MIT girl said she has problems same as what you mentioned, mm -hmm. and she has to fix it. Mm -hmm. Whereas my Harvard girl say, "Oh, we just pass it to the concierge. They have a concierge that goes with them." Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, so this is so we, we kind of hear this a lot. Um, so, Harvard's program. They, they absolutely try to wring out as much as possible all uncertainty out of their project and out of, out of their work. So it is highly structured. Um, yes, they're staying in five star hotels. They have interpreters. They have drivers. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's a... I, I think the main difference is the funding. Uh, yes. In the MIT program, the funding comes from the uh, local company. The host company pays yeah. for round-trip airfare if and it's a travel. they're cheap. They just put them in one star or two star. <laughs> Whereas Harvard fund everything, yes. so they can pay for everything. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> of now, course, you know, uh, tuition fee is different. Right. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, it's in, and I mean, it's an interesting point. Um, and as I said, I think that, so interesting, I, I, I've met with the folks at Harvard a few times, and they've been saying that, you know, we had 900 students, we're sending them out, um, and they absolutely want to make sure that everyone, they, it's, they're very much about having, consistent experiences so that everyone is, so when you show up for your first day on site, you get a script that says, on Sunday you're gonna do this, on Monday you're gonna do this, on Tuesday you're gonna do this, and it tells you everything that you're supposed to do. And I have to say that on some, you know, for, for us, part of the learning and the work for the students is really to have them own all of this. And so, and I have to say, you know, as many times as I say, if there's a problem when you get on site, Please let me know so we can take care of it as quickly as possible. But I think that for some students, they actually really relish this idea of having a little bit more of a rugged experience because they'll talk about, yeah, you know, we slept on the floor of this place for, you know, for, for two weeks or something like that. I'm like, no, you're not supposed to sleep on the floor. Just, you know, tell us and, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll try to do some work around uh, uh, moving you. But, um, but again, the, the, what they're trying to get out of the program is very different. We absolutely want to be able to say, for our, to, we're saying to our students, we're putting you into a situation um, and we do, you know, we do everything that we can to, to address risk management. I mean, I'm on call for 24 hours for the three weeks that they're on site in January and in, um, and in March. And, you know, and I'm checking, you know, I have my phone, I have my house phone and my computer and everything on for three weeks just making sure yeah. everything. Yes, it does. <laughs> they, they, have, they, have, they, have, they have three, they have a faculty and two staff on site with them for their entire time. But again, it's about, you know, we want the students to own the, the relationship and the work. And, I, and the idea is that we want them to feel comfortable taking a small risk on their own. And the pride in which they, they do this work, it, it's really remarkable. And I've, I've talked with a number of, uh, there have been a few companies that have had both um, uh, 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 MIT Sloan team and teams from other places, including Harvard, and they talk about the difference in the quality of work of the Harvard team. I had one, uh, there's one CEO that we work with for a number of years, and he said that um, Harvard, he's an HBS alum, he said Harvard came to me and asked me about taking a team from Harvard, and I said, you know, I've been with Sloan for the last four years, and I'm happy with Sloan, so I'm gonna stay with Sloan. So, yes. Thanks, this is really wonderful and eye-opening uh, presentation. Um, in terms of taking all of the, the lessons that you've learned and, and a lot of the, the experiences, I mean, you're talking about hundreds of projects, hundreds of problems being solved in probably innovative ways. What are you doing, if anything, to kind of say, okay, we've solved all these kinds of different problems. Maybe we can take those same solutions and apply them to other parts of the world and other mm -hmm. industries and other experiences and mm -hmm. and something that would allow let's say we alumni to start participating in this in this knowledge center mm -hmm. and, and start spreading it around mm -hmm. do you want to talk about your yeah, work sure. yeah so um, when the s lab was created the laboratory for sustainable business um, that we teach in the spring term when it was created 
one of the intentions of it was that we take this word lab seriously, that it's a lab that's actually producing something in addition to producing a set of experiences. Um, and the idea was, well, look, sustainability, understanding how to manage sustainability in organizations is under, like, you know, we, we have, it's a very immature field. We don't have the same level of quantitative rigor about how to think about social and environmental performance as we do about economic performance. So let's use this class as a context for the development of decision-making tools and other um, you know, frameworks and perspectives that could be useful for managing sustainability companies. Um, in the first couple of years of running that class, the first several years of running that class, we lost sight of that vision because we were so focused on just you know, the block and tackle of get the experiences happening, get, keep, the, keep the host happy and so on. Now what we're doing is that we've come to learn from our students and alumni how much people are hungry for good tools um, in the sustainability space specifically. Um, and so as a, as, an initi as a broader initiative beyond the class, we're, 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 we have this focal area that we call hardwiring sustainability, which is all about how to bake sustainability concerns into organizations. And part of that is to start thinking about a tools platform. Um, that could possibly, you know, and, and this is very early stage, we're thinking about this being deployed through the Sloan Management Review or with, in partnership with the Sloan Management Review, which is a very natural place for that to happen. And we've started going through, we have all of the past reports from the SLA projects, and we're going through and figuring out where are there tools or frameworks that are extractable from those specific projects to, that we could flesh out and make into something more general. Um, you know, I think that in six weeks, so with SLA, there's no travel, it's a six week project, it's hard for them to go, you know, they develop some insights and some tools, but they're not going into a, a very deep level of depth. What we're noticing is that the LGO theses, for example, or some of the other management theses are developing tools and frameworks that are extremely useful in these contexts. And if we can kind of cross fertilize between what the actual learning teams are coming up with and some of what the thesis work is coming up with, we'll have in our community, there actually are a set of tools and frameworks and perspectives that are going to be very useful to, to, to industry. And, and we're starting to now do some convening around new metrics of sustainable business and so on to, um, to get that extended community of practice together, um, building off what's happening in, in, in the lab. But I would say we're very early stage in that. And one of the things that we're missing is you know, enough staff capacity around, around both the sustainability initiative and the action learning initiative to be able to do that kind of knowledge creation work, and that's one of the reasons why we're in fundraising mode for these for these efforts. Absolutely, and, I, and just to, to add on to that, I think that um, you know it's been you know relatively relatively recently that we've gone from like a couple of labs to all of a sudden now we have you know going on 15, um, and we have to, had some work in terms of working to build a community around the various labs, and aspirationally what we're looking at doing you know, to just kind of drawing off, off Jason's point is to look at um, a more systematic way of collecting um, everything that we've developed in all the different labs and some way of sharing that, uh, sharing the knowledge that has been gained uh, uh, with, you know, across labs and within, within labs. Um, we're not quite there yet, but, um, but that is something that, that, that we are absolutely working on. And, you know, there, there's been such a huge jump in participation and numbers that we're, the, the train is, you know, out the station and we're, running to catch up with it. So there was someone back here, yes. I was wondering, have you taken any of the lessons learned best practices of the process of an action lab and applied it to maybe like the undergraduate and go younger? Mm -hmm. uh, because what we're hearing is that students aren't prepared for the work environment and I feel like by business school it's already too late. Like you, you need to learn these skills okay. up front and earlier and I see it in my children's school at K-12, they're starting sure. to do this a lot. Sure, so, um, so the answer to your question is yes. Um, you know, I, 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 to, to varying degrees, I think, at the undergraduate program here um, at MIT, they absolutely do these kinds of project-based learning opportunities. Maybe not specifically around, say, looking at business challenges, but certainly other kinds of, uh, of challenges. Um, you know, action learning came out of the, uh, the, the corporate sector, and I'm sure you can talk about this, um, you know, back in the 40s in Europe, and then, you know, it was definitely in, in um, you know some some fairly large you know well-known corporations, and then got uh, started started getting was seeping into business schools, and so the 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 business schools take on how to think about action learning is really something that's been evolving since the the 1990s, um, and 
Uh, you also see a lot of action learning being taken up in uh, K through 12 now. Um, they, and they really look at uh, working on projects that fit the, uh, fit the challenge of, you know, say an elementary school student or a middle school student. Um, I would say that the folks that are involved in uh, work around STEM have been doing a lot of innovative work thinking about, they don't necessarily call it action learning, but the way that it's designed and that it acts out. Uh, they, they definitely are taking taking this up in, in many different ways. So um, absolutely, and I actually think that you know I'm, I'm a big advocate of action learning, in you know, all kinds of environments. I do think that it's a way to really help develop people um, in a in a pretty remarkable way. Um, I thought I saw yes. Sure, that's a great question. So. The, the, there are some labs that have a travel component, some labs that don't have a travel component. So the labs that don't have a travel component, there is no fee for that. You, uh, you, um, you, know, you work with the, with the lab faculty, submit a, a proposal, and move forward from there. Um, for the labs that have a travel component, typically we suggest or say that um, we're asking you to cover round trip airfare and the lodging on site. So if it's a fall lab, this is uh, three weeks on site in January. If it's a spring lab, it's two weeks in uh, late March. Um, I always tell companies to budget for a team of four, somewhere in the neighborhood of ten dollars to $12,000. And um, these students are responsible for purchasing their visas, um, local transport, food, everything else. And um, you know, we try our best to uh, to keep the cost relatively low because, again, as I said, you know, we do pedagogically have an interest in targeting small to medium sized businesses, and so for them, you know, uh, 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 contributing to round trip airfare and lodging on site, so that that expense can feel a lot like a lot for them. Uh, but um, you know, we also uh, we we've had some alums in the past that have made donations that we've been able to subsidize, particularly uh, NGOs that we've worked with, um, and that's that's worked out very nicely for some of the students. So just projects they wouldn't have normally had an opportunity to participate in. Yes. Um, I'm hearing a lot about content mm -hmm. and very little about process. And one of my questions is, at the end of participating, are students asked to do a personal reflective piece? where they actually go in inside and say, how have I grown as a person, and how has this changed me? Yes, and I, and I apologize, I, I touched on that briefly. Do you want to talk about LLAB? Yeah, I'll talk about the way we do that. So mm -hmm. in, in LLAB, the way the class works is, you know, as I said, it starts in the beginning of the fall semester with an intensive workshop, and then you have three-hour sessions throughout the fall where you're learning these kind of reflection tools. Then you go off on the field for three weeks. Um, at the end of that experience, you come back, and we do a day-long workshop. Um, before the end of the semester. And that day-long workshop is a chance for people to reflect at the level of, you know, what did you learn about, you know, the world, right? What did you learn about the team and being in this team, and what did you learn about yourself? And the, the, um, the deliverables for LLAB are structured in the same way. So there's a final project report that the team has to produce that lays out, you know, essentially what they did, what they accomplished, what the insights were. Not something, it's actually not a host deliverable. Sometimes it's a separate thing that they'll give to the host to give recommendations or whatever. But there's a team reflection that they write about what was the process they went through and, what, and, and how did they apply the tools. And then each person has to also write an individual reflection paper where they, um, they have to use the tools of the class to unpack their own experience. And in particularly, we, we, we ask them to look for um, you know, a difficult situation in their team or with their host organization that they can really diagnose and understand to tease out some more deep kind of intrapersonal learnings. Because for a course on leadership, that's really you know, key. In the SLAB class that I teach, which is about, you know, kind of analyzing strategic decision making around sustainability, that is a much more analytic class. It doesn't have as much of a personal reflection dimension to it. Um, but we still set aside the last class of, of, of S-Lab for, um, for people to get together, not in their teams, but with others, and reflect about what did you learn about yourself, what did you learn about the team, and what did you learn about the challenge of sustainability, and then you talk about it all together. Um, I would also say that for me, as a project mentor, I do most of, I facilitate a lot of that reflection when I meet with teams. Um, what, in S-Lab, because it's not a travel project, I can meet with the teams every week and a half, and when I do that, we do a check-in, I get them thinking at those three levels of individual team and, or, and, and organization. 
Um, not all faculty mentors do that, right? I'm a leadership guy, so it comes more naturally to me. Others are going to be much more content focused. So I, it's variable across the lab, and it's variable within the lab, to be perfectly frank. And it's just, let me, I just want to add to that. I think that to the point, you know, there's a con so all the labs to some extent have some, have some reflection and we're certainly um, in the context of our, our operations group. So we have a, a, a monthly, for the most part, a monthly meeting of the, of the uh, lab faculty administrators that do kind of the day-to-day -day work in the labs. We have them meet regularly. Um, we have been working to, and then, to, and when I meet with the labs, to talk about this idea of reflection. How do we get students to do it very well? Um, I had mentioned earlier that uh, when I first started, if you say, ask students to do reflection, you know, you get that, those kinds of reactions. And so we had to be, so we'd use different language, like, oh, status updates. And we were using all this, these, you know, uh, the, you know, euphemisms for talking about reflection. Um, and, you know, but I think over time that's changed. Um, anecdotally, my sense is that students that have participated in multiple labs tend to be more reflective and think more deeply about, uh, about their experience. Um, it is something that I, I hear faculty when I first started who, said, oh, we, we can't do reflection because the students always complain about it. And I'm like, I wrote my dissertation on reflection. We were absolutely going to hold it. <laughs> we're absolutely going to do reflection. Um, and so we, um, we, we've been working to work with the students in terms of how they think about it to get them to, to adopt it themselves, which I think is, uh, you know, it's a work in progress. And some do it more successfully than others. I will say something interesting. We, um, well, we had the students in G-Lab write blogs in lieu of writing uh, a personal reflection paper. So we say you have a choice: you write a blog or do a personal reflection paper. Because historically, the, the personal reflection papers were horrible. It was like a like they were reporting. I got up at six. I did this. I did this. I did this. They were dreadful, and everyone hated to read them. We asked them to do a blog completely. We said you just do three, and otherwise you're fine. But the blogs were much better. So overall, so so we're 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 also trying to work with the mediums and work with the ways that they want to reflect. And to Jason's point, the, um, the, the the students work with faculty mentors, and in the pro, in the in those meetings, they tend to have get into those kinds of conversations. But again, it's kind of a continuum. But it is a work in progress, and we do um, absolutely uh, see the importance of having that and being able to unpack that work. Oh, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. uh, did you? Oh. <laughs> I, just, I just want to reinforce what somebody said earlier. Very good that you should find a way to share your findings of mm -hmm. the and learning that uh, of your team. Because like today, I could identify very well with the case you presented. I come from the Philippines with 100 million people. And, uh, and um, the country consumes about 700 million cans of sardines, which is my business. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> we serve the poor of the poor, the poorest of the poor. And every time we raise the price, it costs so much agony. Mm -hmm. So there is a striking similarity of the poorest in India. Yes. Except my solution was I had to sell the business. I couldn't make that out of line. But we will share whatever you can. Yeah, so we have just uh, one more minute, and we'll let you have the last question. So I thought it was interesting taking that a step further um, in the student reflection that you shared. The, the, they mentioned developing a lifelong action learning plan. I'm wondering, number one, if you have any just personal advice on that. And, um, because I, I hear that from a lot of alumni, right, that maybe they want to take a break, do something different. You know, change change tracks, switch gears, maybe you know, change their career. Um, but also, I've been to the summer programs here, and they're terrific. I'm just wondering if there's any interest or, or you know, the thought being given to doing an e-lab type of or any any type of lab in the uh, in the summer programs for alumni. That's a great question. That is a great question. Yes. Um, so, as a okay, so within the context of sustainability again. Um, we have sort of three kind of high level metrics of success or, or strategic goals. One of them is about student engagement and these types of experiences. The second one is visible alumni success. So we're interested in helping alumni be more successful and then making them visible when they do because that reflects well on the school. Um, and the way that we think about making alumni more successful is to support them in being, to support them being in networks of reflective leadership and innovation. Um, we have, there's a group of, 20, of uh, MBA 2012s who all completed the sustainability certificate and really built kind of a, a relationship. They have a monthly Google Hangout um, with the seven of them. Um, and they get together and they reflect. Um, they invited me to join once as sort of like a you know, guest. And, um, and they do a check-in. And, what, and we, this, we've, we've thrown this term around check-in, but I'm just gonna say exactly what a check-in is. A check-in 
is where, let's say that you guys are, this is, you know, you guys are gonna check in. What you do is each person just says some talks once and everyone listens with like a good quality of listening. And when that person is done, you move to the next person. And you don't start a whole conversation among everybody until you've heard from each person checking in once. It is remarkable how powerful check-in is as a discipline in building a team, as Rena said, um, and particularly for doing that kind of reflection work. So I would invite you to think about not sort of, I'm gonna structure a project and go out and go to, you know, do something outside of my zone, but actually think about what you're doing at work as an actual learning project, but what you need then is a context for reflection. And so these are seven students who are all in very different kinds of companies, Cargo, Amazon, um, you know, a startup, uh, social entrepreneurial venture in, in New Orleans, um, uh, you know, another food company. They're all trying to make a difference in their organizations. They're all trying to create positive places to work that have a positive impact in the world. And they get together to reflect on how that's going and hold each other accountable and check in about how it feels and how they're maintaining balance and then all of that. I think that's action learning. I think that's a, that is what that, that's a really great face for alumni action learning. And what we need to do is basically get people in touch with each other enough that they can form those little nuclei and provide a set of tools or guidelines or scripts or so on for how to do that kind of peer reflection. Um, we have some of those tools we've been starting to develop um, and in a very early pilot phase with a group here in Boston. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, stay tuned for the way that we deploy that. Right. And just to echo what Jason uh, shared, um, the what he just described, that is absolutely classical action learning. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's, you know, what, what he described, their, their group, their Google group is an action learning set. Um, and so certainly that is um, something that we would love to have more people adopt. Um, we have come upon our time boundary, so we're going to have to call this close. But again, thank you so much for your participation and for joining us. And please, uh, please do keep in touch with us. We'd love to hear your ideas and more.